Hey everybody, welcome to another IAEI News Live. My name is Thomas Dimitrovich. Today, we're gonna to take a look at Article 240, but I'm, it's a recorded session. I was hoping to go live. Uh, I'm in Santiago, Chile today, and um, I'm recording this just in case, but I don't believe I'm gonna be able to go live just checking at the bandwidths. So this is a recorded session. Uh, we're gonna take a look at Article 240 and some of the changes in the 2023 code cycle that I think might be you might want to need, know about. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the IAEI's analysis of code changes for the 2023 slide deck. And maybe some more. And it all starts now. All right, welcome back. And yes, I am in Santiago, Chile this week, um, working on international codes and standards. And this week is, um, you know, every time I, every time I, I, uh, I travel abroad, I realize how important standards are for especially product development. I mean, <laughs> you know, I look at, um, my little host of uh, of receptacles, okay? <laughs> These are very valuable, very, very, very valuable and important. Um, so if I just look at all of the pieces that I have, this 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 little puppy right here is is uh, is really awesome. So this gets me my my. Uh, my three prong receptacle on this side, this adapter goes into their system here uh, and it can, it can adapt as well. So if, if, uh, if I'm in, uh, depending upon the receptacle outlet, I can plop these little puppies down there, plop those down and it may fit in. Or if I, uh, if I need a standard plug, I can do that and then get it to uh, something that's uh, so if I'm in the United States, I can plug in this way and get over to whatever country I'm coming from. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a world of adapters this week. And I'll tell you, you never realize how important, um, how important these are. Keeping your phones charged, your batteries charged, very important. But standardization, it just really helps me uh, get more of a understanding of the value and the importance of, uh, of product standards. So, but uh, that's not our topic today. That's my life this week. Uh, but in any case, today's topic, I want to take a look at Article 240. So we, you know, we, I, I, and I know we spend a lot of time in chapters one through four, um, but 240 is overcurrent protection. It just might be an important section, article of the code. But um, so that's what we're going to talk about. But before I do that, this thing we call the IAEI analysis of changes. You know, this slide deck and book were developed by all of the code making panel members that IAEI, IAEI has in the NFPA process. Now, IAE, uh, the IAEI is represented by more than just more than uh, on more than just the NEC. There are other committees like 70E and 70B that IAEI uh, engages in, and it's very important that um, that their voice is heard at the table. Very important, and these are the inspector members only of the IAEI. Now, this now analysis of changes, the book was published, and now the, now the PowerPoint is, is, is available or has been available. And if you have a copy of the PowerPoint, I think one of the important things to remember is that the National Electrical Code changes presentation materials. As it's delivered, we start to get good feedback on, you know, we should add this or subtract something. So this slide deck has really grown since it was first released. And if you purchased a copy of 
the analysis of changes slide deck, you we can get you an update to the latest edition of the slide deck because we have more slides in there. We have more information. We've tweaked some of the information. I'll uh, give you an, a, a little overview of some of the changes that were made um, that you may find uh, attractive. Uh, because again, as, as you know, as if you're a presenter like I am, if you're an educator like I am, your materials, I believe you'll understand that when you start engaging with with uh, those who are, are trying to understand your materials, you'll realize at some point, I mean, I don't believe there is a PowerPoint slide deck, an educational book or anything out there that could not benefit from another look after you get into that mode of presenting the materials. So having said that, um, I want to take a look at, as we know, the IAEI is um, publishing documents, just like every nonprofit organization. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations out there that that will, uh, the NFPA, take a look, just think about what the NFPA is going, has gone through, is going through, and other uh, organizations like the NFPA. You create materials and you don't want them copied. The organization relies on the income from these materials, whether they be books that they sell or slide decks, presentations that they sell and membership, right? So membership is a, a very important aspect of sustaining the organization, but also the materials. So the IAEI has their, their legal requirements. They, they basically don't want you to copy, you know, buy one edition and give it to all your friends. That's, that's, it's a illegal. It's, it's just not right. Um, to support the organization takes a lot more than just your membership, okay? So if you are an educator and you present and you educate, we can use the IAEI materials. You can get the IAEI book on the analysis of code changes. And this is just one of those areas. There are a lot of other areas that the IAEI has materials on, a book and a slide deck. If you get that uh, the slide deck, if you are an educator, you bring a bunch of people into the room, get them each a book, get them a book. And if, even if you're not doing the presentation, the resource in the, in the, um, in the 2023 analysis of changes book is is a wealth of information and knowledge that we need to get, share and get out there. So please be mindful of uh, of any types of copyright items and whatnot. But you know, as we grow and change these slide decks, I'm, I'm, I'm my. My word of advice is stay engaged with the IAEI so that you have the latest edition. And Mr. Wages and, uh, and the crew down at, uh, in Texas are doing the best they can to make sure that we're all updated and we're all kept to update with the latest of information in, in, this, uh, in this resource for the industry. So here's the slide I wanted to talk about. Now for the 2023 code cycle, now remember each code cycle the IAEI, as will other um, organizations that are participating in the development, the continued development of the National Electrical Code, NFPA 70, as an industry resource for electrical safety, every organization will be reviewing their membership on committees, and IAEI is no different. The IAEI has a representative, has two representatives, on each code making panel. And we're constantly looking for new talented individuals who have uh, a lot to offer the electrical industry, especially in the improvement of the resources like the National Electrical Code. We recently uh, appointed a new individual to sit on NFPA 70E and and we're moving some people around on the NEC 2026 code cycle for the NEC 2026 code cycle. So there are a lot of opportunities for those of you who want to get engaged with the electrical industry through the IAEI. Now, each of the code making panels 
again, has two individuals sitting on those. And in addition, the IAEI is in a unique position to, to bring to the table chairs of those committees. Now, say, what is a chair? A chair for a code-making panel helps establish the direction. It's a very important and critical role with regard to the code-making panel. And a chair does not necessarily have a voice at the table, okay? Their alternate brings the voice to the table. The chair will make sure that the meeting runs smoothly, that task groups are established and communicated. The chair establishes the direction forward on how we're going to get through all of these public inputs. Because remember, the, the content of the NFPA documents, because these are, these are ANSI process driven resources for the industry, your public inputs and your public comments are reviewed by these committees. And the, what the chairs do for each of the code-making panels it coordinates all of that. They lose their voice and that could probably be very frustrating for some individuals who would just love to get into the debate, but the chair of a technical committee cannot get into the debate. They have to manage everybody who is debating, right? So their primary job, and some people may think, well, it's because that they provide an influence on the technical committee. That individual is just another individual on the panel. They don't carry any more weight from a technical expertise perspective than any other person on that code panel. The reason that you don't have the chair engaging and debating is because the chair's function is to make sure that we're all doing things in an orderly Roberts Rule way, that we're not talking on top of each other, that when the chair realizes there's duplicate, everybody is saying the same things over and over and over, the chair may elect to say, look, we're going to stop this debate. We're going to do a, a, a um, we're going to do a, a straw vote and we're going to see where the code panel is on this issue since it's a highly contentious and debated item. The chair's job is to keep things orderly and moving forward in an orderly, respectable manner. That's the chair's function. And that takes a lot of energy. So the chair's alternate. So anywhere where you see these red stars, Jim Rogers is chair of panel four, Tom Moore, uh, chair of panel eight for the 2023 code cycle. Keith Laughlin was chair of code panel seven. David Humphrey is our chair of panel two. So you'll notice there are various chairs within the uh, code making panels and the IAEI is also represented on the Corlane Committee. Now, what you're looking at here are the list of individuals for the 2023 code cycle. When we move into the 2026 cycle, some of these names are going to change. And maybe the names will be the same, but those individuals might not be on the code panel that they were on for the 2023 code cycle. So I just want to I want to make sure you understand that the individuals who are on the code panels representing IAEI contributed to this slide deck. They, they basically got the ball running. And then there was a team, and this is your team of individuals who worked very hard to keep the slide deck up to date. And David Humphrey, was is the chair of the codes and standards committee and donnie cook myself pete jackson tim mcclintock jim rogers michael savage jody way joseph wages and david williams and i and i would say there are other people who also contributed this is a whole list of others who contributed to um as subject matter experts for the continued development of the content of the IAEI's analysis of changes for the 2023 code cycle. And again, it continues to change. There's one other individual who you're going to, uh, you're going to see uh, the, the images, the characters in this slide deck have a great story behind them. Honestly, 
the the first when I first saw the characters, I didn't quite grasp what was going on. Um, but Dane, the individual pictured here, is an autistic person who a young man who has a great future in front of him, and he drew all of these images, and I think they're absolutely awesome. Dane was diagnosed with autism at the age of three, and he uses drawings to communicate, and he's very good at communicating. Um, the iPad, this is, an, this is an individual who leveraged technology. You know, a lot of good things come out of technology, and here is the iPad gave this individual the tools to, uh, to grow and and express himself we all have ways to express ourselves and i tell you the 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 work that he put in for these characters that that are used throughout the slide deck i think um it adds another dimension and another thought process to think about when you see some of the images and the characters on each of these slides. He created characters throughout. He's even got one for Rudy. I have one on my cup. I didn't bring it with me here to Santiago, Chile, but um, I have an image on my on my on my cup. And if you watch IAEI News Lives, you'll see the uh, the logo on there was developed by him. So, just a great story, I think. And again, it offers a, a depth, uh, another relationship, another depth of understanding of what you're looking at when you get these uh, IAEI analysis of changes. Now, the other thing that I think I would be uh, amiss if I, if I did not speak to this, there are a lot of industry partners that support the IAEI. And remember, when you are part of the organization, these industry partners want to connect with you. They want to answer your questions. Whether you are Sarah Wire or Siemens, Leviton, Thomas and Betts, Pace, they're an educator as well, Schneider Electric, Square D, uh, Ideal, ABB, all of these organizations support the development of these documents when we need product images or, or, uh, or, or just knowledge about technology. There may be one of these manufacturers uh, who, who has a technology that's spoken to with regard, that's in the National Electrical Code, and they provide their technical expertise. So we may not have mentioned these in our, in our subject matter experts that are engaged, but they, each of these individuals who, um, who participate and create products and solutions and knowledge opportunities. The independent electrical contractors, a group of contractors, uh, NECA, uh, all of these different in, in groups are engaged in the electrical industry and bring valuable input to the NEC, to what we do on a daily basis. They're there, all of these individuals on this, all these companies are there to build relationships with you. And you know where you're gonna meet them? I'll tell you where you're going to meet them. You're going to see most of these individuals at IAEI section meetings and chapter meetings and division meetings across the, the United States and Canada and other countries as well. So get engaged with the IAEI. You'll find them setting up a table at some of these meetings and they're there to answer questions and build relationships with you and marry you with other people within their organization that might be able to give you a little bit more depth of knowledge. All right, so, so what I'd like to do now is I would like to take a look at Article 240, and this is how we do that. We've got to come down here to Article 2, there's 242. The moment you see, oh no, that was 210. Here we go, 240. All right, so article, let's talk about Article 240. 240 is overcurrent protection. And I'm at, a, I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage because I'm using both of my computers and my phone to record this, and I don't have my code book. So let's just get this puppy on the road. 240.1. Um, 
only applies for installations. Okay, so here's what happened in 240. All right. <laughs> okay, I gotta, get my, I gotta get my head calibrated here. So, if you recall a discussions about medium voltage, remember medium voltage was a focus for the 2023 code cycle. And what we did in the world of medium voltage and the NEC was we moved things around. Technical changes didn't necessarily occur because the task group, there was a task group, Robert Osborne from UL chaired the task group and, the ta and they're still going, they're still working on it. But the task group's primary uh, focus was to just get the buckets right. So if you recall Article 210, Panel 2 and Article 210, there were just a couple sections that, that were specific to medium voltage, a thousand, um, more than a thousand volts AC, 1500 volts DC. That's sort of the, the, the line of demarcation. So the panel two only had a couple that were specific to medium voltage, but remember everything in, everything in article 210 still applied to medium voltage applications. It wasn't just those two sections. You can't say, well, the only thing that applies to medium voltage are what's found in those two sections. That's not a true statement. Okay. In fact, when we were working through coming up with how are we going to create uh, article 235, which was the focus for panel two on, on, on medium voltage, the discussion that we had at the table, we said, well, it's not going to be an article just comprised of these two little sections. I mean, A, it wouldn't make sense to have an article with two sections. But I think we, I say that I think there's one that exists that way. But in any case, I'll let you try to figure what where that's at. Um, but our discussion was that, well, everything in 210, almost everything, applies to medium voltage as well, where it's applicable. And I'll tell you, we had a challenge of what, 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 what our decision was. What our decision was on panel two was to say, look, we're going to take all of the requirements that are applicable to medium voltage in Article 210 and move those to 235. We're not going to make technical changes because we did this in the second draft. So we didn't make technical changes. We, we did a mass move of our copy and paste, basically, items that were in 210 different sections and moved them into 235 to focus on medium voltage. Well, at the same time we were doing that, panel 10 was also doing something very similar. And 240 was a focus because there were medium voltage requirements in 240. And, and, they, and they, what they didn't want to do, uh, so they had 240, 230 for services, 225 and 215 for feeders, outside feeders, outside brand circuits. So what panel 10 was doing in the second draft was taking all of those medium voltage requirements into 15, 225 and 230 and moving those into 235, just like panel two was moving the contents of 210 medium voltage into 235. And then they created a 235 that is separated in parts, general requirements, uh, branch circuits, uh, feeders and services. Okay, so you'll see that layout. And I, 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 don't, I don't know if they went, I can't remember if we went uh, services first down to branch circuits or branch circuits first, which, whichever. Uh, we moved the requirements into 235, took them out of 210. Well, and we did took them, took the medium voltage requirements out of 215, 235, 225, 230, and 240. But then that meant that we had to adjust the scope. So the scope of 240 is only low voltage. It does not address more than a thousand volts nominal. Now, it just says a thousand volts nominal. In panel 10, I don't even know if we were consistent. You know what you bring up? So I'm gonna tell you a little secret. 
which I have, uh, I have told you about before. NFPA link. If you don't have uh, a subscription to NFPA link, I would highly suggest that you uh, consider it in your budget, either for the, this year or next year. If you uh, can't afford it right now, it is something I would uh, try to figure out how to work that into, into, my, um, into my budget. So let's take a look at 230. The scope of 230. Um, okay, so this, so 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 they did do it. They we 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 did um, for for Article 230. The scope says the article covers service conductors and equipment for control and protection of services not over a thousand volts AC or 1500 volts DC. Nominal. So we put the 1,000 volts AC and 1,500 volts DC there. Let's check 225 because that's all panel 10. And you know what? You know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, um, yep. And we, we got it in 225. Let's check 215. What we're going to learn about is consistency. Did, was panel 10 consistent? And we got it for 215. So in Article 215, we got that covered. We got we got, so we we picked it up in 215. We picked it up in 225. We picked it up in 230. <laughs> but in 240, yep, in 240, in 240, we just said 1,000 volts nominal. So I think we've got some work to do on the scope of Article 240. So I'll point out another thing while I'm here. Look at down there. You have, when you get NFPA link, you have the ability to get enhanced content. Now, the handbook is, is a great resource as well. Uh, but there are, in, there is, uh, every now and then you'll see sections that have expanded information and enhanced content. I'm not going to show you what the enhanced content is because you're going to have to go out and get your copy of NFPA link to see it. But lots of good information, a lot of good information in there. So in any case, uh, so Article 240 uh, scope. So we'll start with 240.1. The scope did change to accommodate the medium voltage applications. Now, how about, uh, oh, here's another big change. Well, not a big change. 240.2. So another thing, remember, so, you know, I, I can't talk about 240.2 which is now titled reconditioned equipment without talking about the changes that were made in Article 100. And in all of the dot twos, pretty much all of the dot twos, at least all of the dot twos that had definitions. Because another significant uh, adjustment, I, I don't, you know, I, when I say change, I'm not sure if I like the word change as it relates to, for example, what occurred with definitions and terms. We moved the definition of all of the terms into Article 100. Did we change? We may have made the, just that moving, you could say it changed the book, but in many cases, it did not change the definition. It simply moved it. And, in, and I believe you may find terms and their definitions. Why do we call it definitions? I mean, think about it. Definition is that which comes after the term because we're defining a term. And I think the more important part are all of the terms that are defined, all of the defined terms, they should change. They should change the title of Article 100 to defined terms, not definitions. What is the title of 100? What's the chat? What's the title of 100? Definitions. I'm going to suggest, ooh, man. Should I make a suggested change to say defined terms? Because I think that it's important, in my opinion. 
it's terminology and it's these are these are defined terms that help us understand and implement the national electrical code uh, but in any case all of the dot twos used to have the defined terms that were applicable to that article now all of the terms are moved to article 100 and that opened up dot two for the most part. So what did we do? What do we do with dot two? Well, we, um, we use it for something else. And I'll tell you what we did uh, pretty much across the board was um, changed it to uh, handle all of the reconditioned equipment requirements. So this was an unspoken, unwritten, it's not in the style manual, the NEC style manual, the manual of style, whatever formal document you look at for the organization of the National Electrical Code, you're not going to find it in Article 90. But each of the code panel, panels, the chairs, remember I told you the, significant of, the significance of the chairs, the chairs were asked to consider moving things to dot two when it comes to reconditioned equipment. And that was relayed down to each of the code making panels and the members made that decision. Um, but for the most part, they all did. So I am, I'm, I'm in Santiago, Chile, remember, and I'm uh, going to drink water. The bottled water is a little different. The bottle itself is a little different than, um, and this says premium natural quality, Benedictino, agua en su máximo estado de pureza. Pureza. Libre de sodio. Good. Bien. Muy bien. All right. Reconditioned. Reconditioning not permitted. So 240.2 is separated into A and a B. Reconditioning not permitted and reconditioned, reconditioning permitted. Now, um, I'm going to get on a Man, I'm going to get on a, uh, a soapbox, I guess you'd call it. Uh, but it's not my soapbox. It's someone else's soapbox. I don't know that I have the same issues. But an individual, a few individuals, have raised the concern of the language when we say what can or cannot be reconditioned. The, and the, the point that was being made was that the NEC is an installation requirement. So, I guess I could argue this both ways, but the, the, the one argument that I heard was, look, Tom, uh, the NEC is not telling me I, I can't install reconditioned equipment. It's just telling me that I can't recondition this equipment. So, and then the other side of that story, I, you know, I've, I've, what I like to do is, um, you know, especially... I mean, I have an opinion about everything. I'm sure everybody does. And, and everything you hear on here is normally my opinion, not the opinion of IEI or anybody else. But I try to stay down the middle. I don't try to um, pick a camp. So I'm going to give you both sides of the arguments here. The one side of the argument is that the NEC is an installation requirement. And it's uh, and so it can't tell you that you... It, it says that you... You can't recondition, uh, or you. it says reconditioning is not permitted for equipment providing ground fault protection of equipment, ground fault circuit interrupters, low voltage fuse holders and low voltage non-renewable fuses, and molded case circuit breakers and low voltage power circuit breaker electronic trip units. It tells you you can't recondition those. And, and, and some will say that doesn't mean I can't install them, right? I mean... <laughs> Now, on the other hand, uh, I've, I, I've posed that, that position because I thought it was interesting. And others have told me, well, Tom, what you should tell that individual is that if you can't recondition it, then you won't be able to install something that is reconditioned because if you reconditioned it, then you violated the NEC because you reconditioned it. So it's a chicken and egg thing. I don't know. I think both of the individuals make a valid point. 
can we improve the language in 240.2 and other .2s across across the articles um, within the NEC? Maybe so. I don't know. But suffice it to say, what 240.2 tells us is what is permitted to be reconditioned and what is not permitted to be reconditioned. Now, what they point out is that you can recondition low voltage power circuit breakers and you can recondition electromechanical protective relays and current transformers. Now, when it comes to circuit breakers, here's the gray area. I don't say I don't I don't think it's a gray area. I think it's I think it's pretty clear. Um, but some people will argue it's a gray area. I'll give you both sides of the, of the picture on this one too. Power circuit breakers are permitted to be reconditioned. Insulated case circuit breakers, an ICCB. Insulated case circuit breakers, that term is actually used in the code I'm just going to search for it. Insulated case. Well, I'll do this with you. So I'm going to do is I'm going to search um, the code here real quick. There we go. I got to get my mouse over there. Insulated case circuit breaker. I think we use it. Maybe not. I'm just going to search for insulated case. I guess we don't. All right, so we don't use the term. All right, so. I don't like the term insulated case circuit breaker because it's a marketing term. It's not uh, defined in the standards. What uh, back in the day, and I'm not sure what year it occurred, but it was um, in a in a far, far, in a land far, far away, in a distant time, all that jazz. Uh, what the industry needed was you have the power circuit breaker, which is the big hunk of metal and Swiss watch that goes into switch gear. And then you have the molded case circuit breaker that goes into panel boards. They needed this, <clears throat> this, this interim stop in between a multi case circuit breaker and the big power circuit breakers. They needed a circuit breaker that could hold those contacts closed longer for higher currents. And to get that done, they made a, I'll just call it a very large multi case circuit breaker. So uh, so they needed a they needed to fill this this they needed this interim step so that you didn't have to go to a power circuit breaker um, and you could use equipment those big gray boxes that aren't the size of switch gear that are our switch boards and what that does is is that makes it, I guess you would call it um, more economical. <laughs> I'm doing two things at the same time. So here is a picture of, here's a picture of a low voltage power circuit breaker. And these devices are relatively uh, large. This also is a power circuit breaker. So I call them the Swiss watch of um, of the electrical industry. This is again, it's labeled as a low voltage AC power circuit breaker, but look what, look what this title is. It says low voltage power slash insulated case circuit breakers. So here's, here's the issue. You take a breaker like this. These are big, these are big beasts. Okay. This circuit breaker, I can list it to UL489 as a insulated case circuit breaker. It's not a power circuit breaker. I could take that same circuit breaker and list it as a power circuit breaker. Now, there are a few breakers that I can do that with, that any manufacturer can do that with. And what that does 
is it blurs the lines when we start talking about what can and cannot be reconditioned. Now, way, the way the, 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 way the, the code language is written, yeah, the way the code language is written is it basically tells you that you cannot recondition a multi-case circuit breaker, but you can recondition a power circuit breaker. Yet, an insulated case circuit breaker is a molded case UL489 circuit breaker. It is not a power circuit breaker. So, you cannot recondition an insulated case circuit breaker. And I'll tell you, uh, the, most manufacturers who make insulated case circuit breakers and do reconditioning would not recondition an insulated case circuit breaker. Now, if it was a power circuit breaker, then they can. And, and I, I, uh, you might say, well, how can you, Tom, how can you say you can't recondition a power circuit breaker, you can't recondition this insulated case circuit breaker when it's basically fundamentally the same breaker that you're relabeling as a power circuit breaker, and yet you can recondition that. And that is a valid, it's a valid argument. It is a valid argument. And I think, in my opinion, what it comes down to, if somebody gets hurt on these devices that are a part, I mean, they serve a very important safety function, and you, and you reconditioned an insulated case circuit breaker that's listed as UL489 that is technically a molded case circuit breaker and the National Electrical Code says you cannot recondition a molded case circuit breaker, that is a point of concern. And it would be a point of having to defend your actions. Again, when somebody gets hurt, right? Now, um, the challenge is how do you write la code language when you when the term insulated case circuit breaker is a marketing term? It's not an engineering term. You don't list a circuit breaker as an insulated case circuit breaker. Yet the industry has it, and you won't find, we already searched the NEC, it's not in there. I believe it is in NFPA 70B, though. So I, I know we did put that terminology in NFPA 70B. I was against it, and um, from my personal opinion, because it's not a, um, it's not a listed product. So... The code has stayed uh, true to form, uh, but the uh, a few other docu documents have not. All right. Uh, so that's uh, the reconditioning. So, and, and I would say the 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 uh, point of contention around 240.2 is going to be that insulated case circuit breaker. Otherwise, it's very clear, in my opinion. All right, other articles. Did we make changes there? I thought we did, and um, I think we updated the list. We removed, I know one thing we did. We removed anything that was in chapter eight. If I'm not mistaken, and I very well could be mistaken, I'm gonna open in a new, open in the background. And if I go to the 20, 2020 code because NFPA link will let me open it and I go to 240 this is the other thing I really like I can flip between the any the, a lot of the, the the different editions 2020 2017 I can throw them all up there and see the differences so 240.2 I thought included chapter 8 watch me prove me wrong Wow, and it didn't. We must have taken it out of a different, uh, a different, a different 240.3. Uh, it wasn't 240.3. It may have been a different article. But uh, so see, and that's why we do this. That's why we have NFPA link because in my mind, I remember taking it out of there. And uh, so it will be different. Uh, they did not have chapter eight references in there, but keep your mind, keep a, a lookout because I know panel ten removed references to chapter eight articles in the front of the book because they stand alone and we can't reference back to chapter eight, but chapter eight can re reference back to chapters one through four, one through seven. So in any case, um, 
we made some uh, tweaks in um, in 240.3 for other articles. And I don't know, I don't believe that is in the slide deck. Um, yeah, we didn't put that in the slide deck just because it's it's just minor. Those are cor <clears throat> small corrections. All right, so 240.4 is another area that we made some, or that the code making panel made some changes to. Ah, uh, yes. Now, okay. You know how in the code we will reference, or the code will reference, I keep saying we, the code <laughs> references, it'll say the next standard ampere size. And then what do we do? We go to 240, there's a table in here, 240, there it is, 240.6 uh, gives us the table of standard ampere ratings. Now, what the change was in 240.4. In 240.4b, overcurrent devices rated 800 amps or less. If the overcurrent protected device is an adjustable trip device installed in accordance with 240.4b, one, two, and three. So that means, um, okay, whatever. It shall be permitted to be set to a value that does not exceed the next higher standard value above the ampacity of the conductors being protected as shown in 240.6a where restricted access in accordance with 240.6c is provided. Quite frankly, <laughs> I, I didn't have a problem with the language, but I don't know that you needed it. I really don't, because um, what does it say? 240.6b says the next higher standard overcurrent device rating shall be permitted to be used provided all of the following conditions are met. So this is the next higher, is permitted to be used. It doesn't say it shall be used. So when it's something says it is permitted to be used, if you have a setting that is less than that, you can use it. You can use something smaller. You just can't go above it. So it says the next higher standard over current device rating shall be permitted to be used provided all of the following conditions are met. One, the conductors are being protected, are not part of a branch circuit supplying more than one receptacle for cord and plug connected portable loads. The ampacity of the conductors does not correspond with the standard ampere rating of a fuse or a circuit breaker without overload trip adjustments above its rating, but that shall be permitted to have other, uh, other trip or rating adjustments. The next higher standard rating selected does not exceed 800 amps, so they don't want you to go above. So this is 800 amps and less. So then it says, if the overcurrent device, this is the added language, if the overcurrent protective device is an adjustable trip device installed in accordance with 240.4b, which is what we're reading. So you're, that's saying that you're meeting B1, B2, and B3 restrictions. It's permitted to set the value of the adjustable trip device so that it doesn't exceed the next higher standard value above the ampacity of the conductors being protected as shown in table 240.6a and 240.6a is is the table that we just talked about so honestly i mean i mean i i didn't see any harm voting for it and supporting it but i'm asking what does it get you So I can, if the overcurrent device is an adjustable trip device installed in accordance with, maybe, I know what it means. I know what this is getting you. So if I, for example, let's say I have a, I don't know, um, a 2,500 amp frame breaker. I means I can adjust it up to 2,500, 2,500 amps. If I adjust it to 700 amps, which may be 
higher than the ampere rating of the, uh, not the ampere rating, but the ampacity of the conductors of the circuit. As long as I don't exceed the next higher uh, rating, which is in the uh, rated device, which is in 240.6a. So if if it's if it's say it's 700 and I can adjust it to say that say that the next higher is is 700. And I've got a 2000 amp breaker, I could adjust it to 650 or 698 or whatever. I mean, it, it depends upon the electronic trip unit, how, how fancy I can get with my settings. As long as I don't exceed 700, I am I'm good. And this gives you the permission and then I would have to lock it and restrict access. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm just really, um, I'm really torn on the addition of that language on whether or not we actually needed it. I'd love to know your thoughts. Take a look at the language in 240.4b, the added text. Tell me what your thoughts are. You can respond to this uh, video. Take a look at it. Uh, respond to the video. Give me your thoughts. Did we need that language? What does it get you? I believe, I, in my mind, from what I'm reading, what I'm seeing, then I'm thinking that we're covered in 240.6 when we think about the amp, about the ampere rating of the device. Because it says the next standard overcurrent device rating above the ampacity. So the overcurrent device rating is defined in 240.6. 240.6 is standard ampere ratings. You have A, which is the table. You have B, adjustable trip circuit breaker. So if I have a, an adjustable trip circuit breaker and I adjust it to what I just said, so 695 amps below the 700, and I lock the cover and I follow the rules and C for local restricted access, then I'm covered. So I think 240.6B gets you what was being sought in 240.4b. But you tell me, let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one. All right, so uh, the other change that we, um, that we added, I got to look at my, uh, just gotta make sure I'm on cue here. All right, so the other change that we added, and I'm going to go through the rest of these pretty quick. Um, I spent a lot of time on those first few, but this just, so my point on this, and I did spend a little bit of time on each of those, but it's depth of knowledge. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to talk a little bit about the background on these because sometimes these changes, I mean, you can... You can look at them and say, well, what's the significance of it? Until you start to really dig into it, then you start realizing, wow, either A, like we just talked, did we really need it? Or B, what about that insulated case circuit breaker? How do I handle that when I see that in the field? What do I do? How is it listed? Anyway, 240, we got some changes in 240.4. We already talked about B. Uh, small conductors, we added the, um, the 10 amp. 10 ampere, 14 odd, 14 gauge copper clad aluminum. Uh, continuous loads not exceeding eight amps. Uh, again, um, we still need the changes in 310. So I, I don't know how I can how we can leverage what we've done here uh, without the uh, changes in 310. Uh, transformer secondary conductors. Do we have a change in there? Not really. We changed some of the references in 240.4G. Uh, dwelling unit, this is new, 240.240, what is this, 240.4, 240.4H, dwelling unit service and feeder conductors. Dwelling unit service and feeder conductors are permitted now to be protected against overcurrent at the opacity values in 310.12. That's, I, I think that's, that's an interesting one. All right. Okay, let's take a look at 240.5. 240.6, they added the 10, well, so they didn't add 10 amps. 10 amps in 240.6 resided just for fuses, standard ampere ratings. 
the discussion, because of all of the 10 amp copper clad aluminum dis debates and all that jazz that's still going on today, um, we realized that they, we make molded case circuit breakers at 10 amps and it's a standard ampere rating. So why isn't, why isn't it in the table for standard ampere ratings for fuses and inverse time circuit breakers? It was only in there for fuses. So we moved the 10 amp uh, ampere rating into the table in 240.6. Uh, and then to, to D, remotely accessible adjustable trip breakers. This is where we uh, bring in the, the uh, cybersecurity. And if you're connecting a circuit breaker, because you know that you've got smart breakers these days, if you connect a circuit breaker through a networked interface that complies with a, either A, that the circuit breaker is, or, or the associated software for adjusting those settings are identified as being evaluated for cybersecurity. That's going to be a listing requirement. We can look at the informational notes for background and information on that. And then B, a cybersecurity assessment of the network has to be completed. Now, it's one or the other. And, and I'll tell you, there were two schools of thought uh, in this one. I'll just, uh, whoop. I was going to show the language there. There were two schools of thought being um, evaluated on, on this one. Um, the circuit breaker, so the first one, well, it's just, the first one is the device itself has to be listed. And, and the argument there by some was, look, if I have a bad actor and the bad actor is the device, maybe the manufacturer didn't follow certain rules and regulations with regard to sourcing their components and that there's a chip on this device that has been compromised where it doesn't matter any of the cybersecurity things that you do to harden the system or protect from people engaging you have a compromised system and 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 they'll give you cases where that actually happened to transformers and other uh, equipment out there, drives that were compromised on installation. And then at, at a point in time, uh, say a drive just started to accelerate the motor and until it uh, achieved a rapid disassembly in the field. So that's the challenge is um, how do we how, how do you ensure cybersecurity? I mean, so the, the, so the, the, that's one school of thought is it, it has to be listed devices. The other school of thought was, look, don't require a listed device, just do a cybersecurity assessment, which will identify the hazards, the, the risks. And then, and then you get into a discussion when you talk to somebody about cybersecurity, you'll get into this discussion of, of risk likelihood and severity. I may have a circuit breaker on a piece of equipment that's out there on the web, and I really don't care if it gets hacked. I don't care if you turn it on and off. In fact, it might be my decoy. <laughs> you make that the vulnerable spot and you think you're doing something great. Um, should I make it be required to be a listed product? Some will say, no, why would you invest in, in that product being listed when you don't, the, the risk is low. The severity is really low. The, the um, likelihood is very high, but who cares if they get a, uh, if, if anybody gets, it gets into it. So that's the debate on this one. So we have it now in 240.6D. Uh, if you have a circuit breaker that is connected that is remotely can uh, that, that can be adjusted remotely to modify the adjusting means um and you're can you can connect it through a local networked interface which doesn't have to have anything regarding cybersecurity. but if you connect it through a networked interface it has to comply with one of the following and they give you two options now what i find interesting is and in this again we'll, we can debate cybersecurity to the nth degree, but the requirement is that you have to have an assessment done. There's no indication of what kind of performance le uh, level it needs to be. You just have to be aware. 
All right, so that's 240.6, uh, 8, 9, 10. We changed the title of 240.12 to orderly shutdown instead of selectively coordinated or a coordinated system. And that was because we made a change in, uh, I think it was 240.11. Yep, we added a new, and it's not indicated in link, but it is a new section. 240.11 is selective coordination. One or more feeder overcurrent devices are required to be selectively coordinated. This is a complicated, I, you know what I'll do is I'll do a selective coordination discussion and we'll talk about the latest changes because this one could take an hour unto itself. All right. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I'm looking at the uh, presentation 240.7. Oh, 240.7, listing requirements. Circuit breakers are now required to be listed. GF GSCIs and ground fault protection of equipment are, are required to be listed. Um, I was surprised that a brand circuit over current protected device was not required to be listed in the past. Well, it is now. So 240.7, and then you probably have already been looking for the UL mark or the, the, um, uh, the Intertech mark, whatever the mark is from the nationally recognized testing laboratory that provides those marks. Um, but they are required to be listed. And GFPE is required to be listed, so is GFCIs. Uh, we talked about the 240.11, so I'm just going to go through and see. I'm not going to go through all of those slides. There were some changes in interrupting ratings, um, accessibility as well. You're not allowed to put these in a bathroom anymore. No overcurrent devices. So overcurrent protective devices, other than supplementary overcurrent devices are no longer allowed in any bathroom. I have a personal opinion on that one. I, I, don't, I don't understand. So it, it's accessing, it's accessing the bathroom. Uh, when it's it's occupied, um, a lot of people all will say that. Um, a lot of people will say, "Well, wait a second. You know, it's the environment. It's the rain. I'm not rain, but it's the, it's the 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 humidity, etc." But I can put, if I put a four, if I, I could put an enclosure outside. Uh, I'm not worried about putting it in the shower itself. All right. If I can put it outside in the direct rain and all that jazz, uh, I sure as heck can put it, it, give you an enclosure that can live in the environment of a bathroom. But it's all about the accessibility. And that's pretty much the changes in Article 240. So um, obviously, I, you know, I, I didn't go through all of the slide deck because you need to go to a section meeting or you need to go to a chapter meeting or a division meeting of the IAEI and listen to what others have to say about these changes. And take a look through Article 240. Go get your NFPA link. Take a look down through Article 240 and let me know your thoughts and opinions on some of the changes that are there, especially the one that I pointed out. I'd love to know your thoughts on that one. All right, so hopefully we got something out of our, uh, our discussion today. All right, thank you everybody. I am going to go to dinner and find out what the Santiago chili cuisine is like. Thanks for watching. Thanks for taking time out of your day to explore the National Electrical Code and another technical topic. Thanks for what you do for the electrical industry and especially for what you do for electrical safety. I know I care and I, and, and I love you for it. So thank you for all you do and your commitment to saving lives. It's what we do. It's what we need to do. Until next week, I will see you next Tuesday. Take care, stay safe, God bless, and stay healthy. See you next week. Again, I am uh, in a world of adapters after adapters after adapters.
uh, one plugged into another plugged into another let's see how many of these I can how many of these I can plug into each other plugged into that one plugged into that one plugged into that one so welcome to international travel Mr. Dimitrovich and uh Maybe one day in the future, we'll talk about some IEC standards and installation requirements and differences. As I learn, I will share what I learn with you all. So I think that in my opinion, it's very interesting to see some of the nice things, differences, you know what I, and what I really like, I'll be honest with you. You'll notice this recept, this plug, and I might even cut this out of the video, I don't know, but this plug, this portion actually sits inside. I don't have one here because all of these are flush mounted, uh, and I'll show you what that means. But this, when I pull this out, there is no way for me to touch these two exposed parts while they are engaged in the circuit. Think about how we do things in the United States and Canada and any other location that deals with, oh, just unplugged my computer, these types of, of items, right? I'm gonna plug it back in again. If you put your fingers in around there, when you pull that out, you can touch those two prongs. This, because this portion right here is inset. By the time I get my fingers here, by the time I pull out to get to this, they are definitely disengaged. That's that type. This type, look at that. You see these tips are the only parts. So when you plug in and I pull this out, there is no way, there's no way that I'm touching these tips while they are still engaged with the circuit. I don't know about you, but I like that. I really do. So there are things I, I hate about this world of adapters. There are things I like that are different. Every single circuit has ground fault protection. Every single circuit has ground fault protection. It's not at the four to six milliamps that you and I live with. It's, over, it's, it's at 30 milliamps, but every single circuit has ground fault protection. Think about that. Uh, there's just some things I like about the, um, about the, uh, the world of international codes and standards, and there are things I don't like. And you know what that means? Opportunities are all around us.